I'm Christopher Hope, Chopper to my friends, Associate Editor at The Telegraph, and welcome to Chopper's Politics Podcast. Well, after a week in hiding when the pound tanked and many of us worry about our mortgages and pensions, our Prime Minister Liz Truss has finally broken cover. Where else but BBC Local Radio, where she toured the studios on Thursday morning to defend the controversial and difficult decisions she said she had had to make with Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng to get Britain's economy growing again. And it's safe to say didn't go fabulously well. Great to be here on Radio Radio Leeds. I am really glad that you are here as well, because since Friday, since your Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng's mini budget, the pound has dropped to a record low, the IMF has said that you should reevaluate your policies and the Bank of England has had to spend £65 billion to prop up the markets because of what they describe as a material risk. Where have you been? Well, I think we've got to remember the situation we were facing this winter. No one can deny you enter Downing Street with a difficult job on your hands, but you've made the situation worse so far, haven't you? Well, let's remember the situation we were facing when I entered Downing Street. Time is short, so I'm going to just blaze on into the questions. Lots from my listeners this morning. Carrie in Birchington says, what on earth were you thinking? The country was already in a state of recession. And another says, how can we ever trust the Conservatives with our economy again? And Lydia says, are you ashamed of what you've done? Are you? I think we have to remember what situation this country was facing. We were going into the winter with people. We've also taken action to reduce our tax burden and spur. Yeah, but pr- Prime Minister, with projects, respect, that so is we the same scripted answer you've given going. to every BBC local radio station this morning. You've got the Bank of England stepping in now to try and clean up a mess. A government has caused that has never happened. We have a very, very difficult economic global situation because of the war that Vladimir Putin has perpetrated in Ukraine. Oh dear, not easy of course, answering questions from different journalists in different parts of the country, often about local issues. But really, she should do a bit better than that, don't you think? But is the problem with trustonomics that it hasn't been explained or sold well? Or is it fundamentally flawed? Well, somebody who can break it all down for us dear listener, is Julian Jessup, an economics fellow at the Institute for Economic Affairs and also an unofficial advisor to Truss's campaign through August. Julian Jessup, welcome to Chopper's Politics. Hello. Who is to blame for what's happened to the markets in the past few days? First of all, I think most of what the government has done in terms of economic policy since Liz Truss was elected has actually been very, very good. So the energy price guarantee has significantly reduced the chances of a a deep recession. The cancellation of the planned increases in corporation tax and the reversal of the hike of national insurance, I think, has been really good as well. That part of the strategy has been warmly received. So people at the National Institute of Economic and Social Research, who by no means necessarily friends of the Conservative Party, were saying that that was a, a good thing. Um, and they've also made a good start on the on the supply side reforms, um, which is, of course, the, the big thing they need to do to get productivity and, and therefore growth up. So um, I think the overall strategy has been... Uh, yes, examples of the, what are your examples of, the, of those reforms? What are they, the, the supply side reforms in your... Well, they've made it clear, for example, they're finally going to tackle the problem in the in the planning system, which is holding up not just house building, but but all sorts of other infrastructure projects that are, that are really, really important. Indications of plans to do big things in the financial sector as well. So, you know, getting rid of some of the EU rules that are preventing longer term investment in the in the economy by by UK institutions. So th- those are the things that will make the really big difference as well on the supply side. I think we're playing a, a blame game, but I think there was one tactical mistake, which is um, pre-announcing the the cuts in the in the basic rate of income tax and in particular the abolition of the of the 45 percent rate of, of income tax so now as it happens the the, the sums of money there are, are pretty small we're only talking you know, about two billion for the for the additional rate of, of, of income tax but announcing that much earlier than you had to you know when the, those tax changes don't come into effect until april next year without also having the the full obr analysis and you know all the number crunching to go with it i think that's what really spooked the markets 
I think there's also an extent to which you know Kwasi Kwarteng has been, if you like, sort of unlucky general because all of this has happened at the time of you know turmoil in global financial markets. So you know the dollar has been strong against across the board, not just against the the, the pound, uh, and bond yields have been rising everywhere for a similar reason, which is expectations of big increases in interest rates from the U.S. central bank. So there's an element of a, a bad luck in there uh, as well. But I think there was that tactical mistake of, of pre-announcing those tax cuts before you had to. Because they were quite small. I'm looking here at the blue book given to us all last Friday called the Growth Plan 2022. And it said there that the cost of, of, the, of the additional rate is $2.065 billion by 26, 27. And that's dwarfed, isn't it, by the, by the, by the removal of the, of the NICS increase, $18 billion, dealing with um, corporation tax, $18.7 billion. And added to that $60 billion, $60 billion is just a six-month cost of the, of the energy, energy bailout for lots of families. So that's £100 billion pounds spent. And we're worrying about just a, a two billion pound, two billion, which is uh, nugatory or not much compared to the, the, the overall um, scale of spending elsewhere. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's really frustrating, partly because it's it sort of made the market reaction worse, but also you know, politically. I'm, I'm not too personally concerned about the impact of all of this on the opinion polls, but the, the, the combination of that, that cut in the 45p rate and, and getting rid of the banker's bonus cap, even though they're absolutely the right things to do, you know, they're basically a gift to the to the opposition at this time. And so the opposition can point not only to the, the impact on, on the markets, but also the impact on the on the opinion polls and the two are feeding into each other. Who do you blame for this? I mean, is it? Do you not think it was made worse by the Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng going on the Sunday morning interview program on the BBC and saying that actually we'll, we'll do more cuts, and yet again there has been no actual um, OBR estimate to what this might mean for the mean for the economy. I agree that was that was unhelpful as well because that seemed to be turning a you know a deaf ear to the concerns of the of the markets. I'm, I'm wary of blaming anybody though because it was pretty clear that this was going to be the strategy of the, of the new team was this combination of, of, of tax cuts and, and supply side reforms uh, maybe they've moved a little bit quicker on some aspects of that than others but they are you know sticking to their guns and and certainly my advice to them now would be to, to continue with this strategy I think it is you know fundamentally the right strategy I think the turmoil in the in the markets will blow over and since the weekend they they have said I think some very sensible things so they have confirmed that there will be that the media term fiscal plan that was was missing last week that will that will come in november and details of more supply side reforms in the meantime hopefully on top of that the financial markets do seem to be calming down so you know sterling does seem to stabilize the the intervention from the from the bank of england in the guilt market w- was helpful so um, i think that has brought breathing space is that an embar- embarrassing for the bank to step in after, after five days after the mini budget well it's, it's certainly not ideal it's you know like the old joke you wouldn't want to, st- wouldn't want to start from here but i think in the circumstances it, it, it was correct it's worth stressing that the the turmoil in the in the guilt market i mean yes it, it was partly as a consequence of the way that the, the budget landed so poorly, but but also lots of technical factors there, in particular the way that you know pension funds had to to start selling gilts to um, cover margin calls and you know, provide cash collateral for uh, for some of their derivatives exposure. So there are a lot of, sort of technical factors there. It's not as if the markets as a whole were fundamentally losing confidence in, in the UK economy or the government. It was exacerbated by sort of technical factors in the markets. And in those circumstances, the Bank of England was just doing its job. This is about financial stability, the liquidity in the markets. It's not about monetary policy or inflation. Can I ask you what, what, what you think the rush was to announce all this uh, uh, out of kilter with an OBR assessment? Well, why not wait until November 23, which is the date of the the new date of this of these forecasts. Uh, well, the honest answer is I don't know. I, I, I wasn't in the room when that that decision was made, and actually, to be honest, it would have been inappropriate for me to be in that room because that's a you know a budget decision and that information is is market sensitive. So um, I, I honestly can, you know can't ask that question. I think they perhaps just made a political judgment that this is the direction of travel. We want to send the clearest possible message that you know this is a. You know, a fundamental change from the previous orthodoxy, and we're, we're, we're deadly serious about this. But um, unfortunately, the, the timing wasn't great because global markets were were super nervous anyway. Um, I mentioned earlier that the weakness in the pound. I mean, the big story in Asia this week is that the, the Chinese currency, the renminbi, has also fallen to a new record low against the US dollar. Um, so there's lots of concerns everywhere about currency strength or weakness and rising interest rates. So the timing just wasn't great. 
I think they have been unlucky with timing this government. I mean, they have been weighed down by huge events, haven't they? The COVID crisis, the invasion of Ukraine, the ensuing energy crisis, um, the, the, the very sad death of our, our Queen has meant that so many big things have happened. They've had, they've had to try and squeeze in their kind of agenda around these big things, haven't they? Which is, of course, a correct and how it should be. But it's meant that there's a feeling of they're trying to squeeze a lot of things into a few days. I mean, last week was, it was crazy, wasn't it? I think maybe if, if there is a mistake here, I think maybe the Chancellor made the mistake of saying that, you know, we, we, we're we going to go big and not worry about short term volatility in the financial markets, which I think actually in normal times is a perfectly reasonable position. You know, I've, I've, I've worked in the city. I know that markets always overreact, in particular at times of, of heightened uncertainty. Investors just don't like change. And I do think that the policy is, is fundamentally right. But I think in the circumstances we've had at the moment, you know, sentiment in the markets was so fragile, at least as much because of the global concerns as, as any particular worries about the UK. That was just maybe a small step too far. But I don't think we've, we've jumped over a cliff here. I think that, as I say, markets are already starting to, to stabilise. The underlying strategy is, is correct. And so my strong advice to the government will be to stay the course and certainly not to U-turn on any of these individual measures, as some have recommended. It's, it's all very well telling the public not to panic, but people are having emergency meetings uh, in families to look at when they have to renew their their mortgage, aren't they? I mean, is and the problem you might have is that any subsequent increase will be pinned on Quasi, Quatang, and Liz Trust. It won't be blamed on markets and other global factors. I mean, it seems to me that all, all, the, all the world is sheltering from these, these um, the energy crisis and the, the markets generally um, are, are turbulent. And, and rather than sheltering, we've run out into the rain, stripped off our clothes, and, and we're dancing naked in the rain, but we're getting whacked by, by lightning. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's clearly a danger. We, we've seen that in the opinion polls that the, the government is is blamed for increases in, in interest rates. I, I actually think that's unfair. I think the reality is that interest rates have been far too low for too long. So I, I've been on phone calls on the radio where people have been complaining that their interest rate at the moment, which is basically zero, might go to something like three to four percent. But Without wanting to, to be harsh, it, it, it's unrealistic to expect interest rates to remain near zero for the entire lifetime of a... That's a 400% mortgage. increase for them, isn't it? It is. And again, I'm not in any way dismissing the concerns that they have. But the point about higher interest rates is that they actually they, they do need to go up because the alternative, if we kept interest rates lower for even longer, then it would actually result in even more inflation and even bigger increases in interest rates further down the line. So I'm afraid that you know we, we do have to accept the reality here that interest rates have been too low for too long. And if I were looking to for somebody to blame here, actually I wouldn't blame the government for this. I'd, I'd, I'd blame the Bank of England. We, funny enough, we're in an odd position now where the Bank of England, I think you know, rightly, can claim some credit this week for stabilising the, the gilt market. And as and when the Bank of England does raise interest rates more aggressively, perhaps it can, it can blame the government for that. But at the end of the day, it's been the Bank of England that's been too slow to to raise interest rates. And it's because of what the Bank of England has done that we're going to end up with bigger increase in interest rates than we would otherwise needed to have. Um, what, what, for, for, for laymen then, what you mean by that is they should have pushed up interest rates last year. They should, the MPC should have met and dealt with this a year ago. Yes, I think that that's right. And I think also it persisted with so-called quantitative easing, in other words, you know, money printing to, to buy government bonds longer than it should have done. So that was storing up problems for the future. I mean, to, to be clear, I don't think interest rates need to rise anywhere near as far as currently priced into the market. I mean, lots of talk about interest rates going up to five or maybe even six percent. I personally think that the sort of the, the new normal or the long run neutral rate is probably going to be around about four and a half percent. I suspect won't even get that far in the coming months because the economy is still fragile. High levels of debt, particularly mortgage debt, um, also mean that the economy is more sensitive to, to interest rate increases than it's been in the past. So I, I personally think interest rates will, will level out at around about 4%. In which case, actually, some of those mortgage rates should start to come down again. So un unless you are forced to refix in the next month or two, and I, I obviously appreciate some people will, I think the, the fallout for the housing market in the longer term will be much less serious than many people fear. Well, let's hope that's right, definitely. Uh, you were in touch a lot with the Trust campaign um, through the campaign, July and August, and you haven't really spoken to them since they got back to office because the death of the Queen has made it very difficult to talk to people who about things and get together. What is Trustnomics in, in your mind, Julian? <laughs> okay, in, in one tweet with um, three points in it. One is it's a, 
an, an emphasis on boosting the economy through um, supply side reforms and, and tax cuts. The second point is you know, a willingness to be bold and decisive. For example, the energy price guarantee is, is, is not a policy that I would normally recommend, but I think in the circumstances it was, it was the correct one to do. And then the third thing is to do things that you think are right for the economy in the longer term, even if they're unpopular in the short term. So that would be things like getting rid of the banker's bonus cap and also the abolition of the, the 45% rate. So th- those, I think, are the basic elements of trustonomics. And so that, and all that still stands in your mind. I mean, despite all the battering in the markets and looking at the front page of the Telegraph here saying pension funds crisis forces £65 billion bailout by bank, despite all that and the heavy political collateral being aimed at the government, stick with the programme. I think that, that's absolutely right. I mean, clearly there, there are some elements of the programme that need to flesh out better. So in particular, the, the, the medium term fiscal plan, because the, uh, one of the missing parts at the moment is a, is, is a clear plan to get debt down as a, as a share of national income, which is, is you know, the most important element of the sustainability of the public finances over the longer term. So, so markets and, and, and the rest of us need clearer signals about how that is, that is going to be done. That's about you know, fleshing out the plan. It's not about doing a U-turn on what you've already said. And just finally, will you be joining uh, Liz Truss's Council of Economic Advisors? I have, I have no idea. It's probably about as likely as my mother appearing on Big Brother. So we'll see. <laughs> well, look, tune in for Big Brother. Look, listen, Julian Jessup, thanks for joining us this week on Chopper's Politics to explain what on earth Trustonomics is. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I'd be fascinated to hear what you think about what Julian had to say, listeners. Is the worry about trustonomics and the market's reaction overdone? Email me, chopperspolitics at telegraph.co.uk or tweet me. We're at Chopper's Podcast. Now, I do say with us, listeners, coming up, I'll be joined by the new Victorian Albert trustee, Zuditu Gebrahanes, to talk about her concerns about the National Trust and the woke war right after this. It's painful to imagine that someone would ever have paperwork about child abuse and not do everything in their power to bring the abuser to justice. But I've been speaking to people who say that seems to have happened in the Jehovah's Witnesses. Not only was he aware of the abuse, he had heard the confession of it. My colleagues and I on the Telegraph investigations team have been gathering evidence for the best part of a year, but I don't think any of us were prepared for what we'd uncover. You just wonder, what what is going on here? I'm Catherine Rushton, and this is Call Bethel, a new audio series from The Telegraph. Subscribe now, wherever you get podcasts. And we're back. Now, we've spoken about the National Trust a few times on this podcast over the past few years as arguments rage about the so-called culture wars and Britain's imperial past. And that debate has prompted some people to step up and try and change the National Trust and perhaps bring it back to where its core values are, which is conserving the best of our nation's heritage. With me now is Zuditu Gebrahanes from Restored Trust and also a new Victorian Albert Museum and trustee. Zuditu, welcome to Chopper's Politics. Thank you very much. In the Red Lion pub. What's gone wrong at the National Trust? Well, quite a lot has gone wrong, actually. Um, And it goes back quite a few years, but we first saw the signs with the interim slavery report a couple of years ago. I mean, that was it wasn't the first sign, I suppose, but it was a symptom of something that's been going on for much longer. And essentially what's been happening is the increase in commercialisation and bureaucratisation of the National Trust. And that has led to an exodus of the specialist curators, especially sort of, you know, people who are interested in paintings and architecture and preserving historic houses, gardens. So um, have they forgotten what they're for? I mean, they, they got rid of a lot of those curators, didn't they, to save money when they're sitting on, sitting on a lot of reserves. Exactly. So why, is, why the two things don't really marry up for lots of people? No, exactly. And the, the reason they got rid of them, of these specialists, ostensibly, I mean, they, they, lots of them were, were made redundant. But the reason for that ostensibly was to cut costs. And of course, there was a pandemic happening and things. But if it really were for that reason, why don't they hire them and now that it's been found that actually the National Trust didn't do very badly and has got so much in reserves, much more than it intends to have in reserves. 
And these are people, I think, who are genuinely interested in preserving history, which is the founding duty of the National Trust. Um, and, and because they've left, it's opened up a whole other things of history or heritage not being preserved well and it goes far beyond the slavery reports and going into irrelevant things. I should ha- explain that's a report on colonialism and, and slavery and, and linked as many think a hundred properties didn't it yeah. to issues with the colonial and, and imperial past. Including chart country. wells you know the, because well, of Churchill church church exactly born. yes um, but it's but it's actually I think the issues now are much more worrying I think because you've got completely anti-democratic in, in a huge members or organization like the National Trust, you wouldn't expect policies that go against democracy within the trust. And of course, there is a lot of rhetoric from the National Trust management about how democratic the National Trust is. And Jan Lasik, who's the general counsel and secretary of the National Trust, wrote an article quite recently saying we want to hear, we want members to have be able to have a say in things. But actually, in practice, the National Trust doesn't, doesn't do that. And of course, you've got the chairman's discretionary proxy vote, which means that reformative resolutions are of, often voted voted down and actually because, because they, they can vote that they have the choice to vote vote votes how they want to do don't they as chairman yes exactly well if you you as a member you get the option to vote for or against or to abstain on a resolution and what happens is if you are particularly exercised about one or two resolutions you will vote on them and then perhaps you'll forget to vote on other resolutions or you'll just leave those blank and one might assume that that's an automatic abstention whereas in reality what it is is an automatic gifting of that vote to the chairman to cast as he pleases and that's and that has led uh, that led last year to two reformative resolutions being voted down um, that would otherwise have passed very comfortably so, so your campaign R- restore trust and you're the director of it is yes. to, to is to try and re orientate the trust back to what you think it should be doing which is which is what which is which is um i mean to quote from the statute which is the permanent preservation for the benefit of the nation of land and tenements including buildings of beauty or historic interest and so that's very clear and it's uncontroversial and and we are simply trying to return the national trust to doing that and you've got things like clandon house for instance now which burned which was completely gutted by fire in 2015 seven years later having received the insurance payout of 66.3 million pounds they've decided that actually no we're not we're no longer going to keep our promise of restoring the interior of the house but are actually going to build concrete walkways from which people can admire the evocative spaces created by the fire and that's a quotation and 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 build a glass roof which i think for any member you know that's really quite weird to spend 66 66- Point three million pounds when you're a heritage organisation set up permanently to preserve these places, uh, I think is quite shocking, and it shows the direction in which the National Trust is moving. There's a lack of care, you think? I mean, should, should, it's quite hard to recreate Clandon House. The house was burnt down. Well, there are lots of there are lots of houses that have been restored. Things like Up Park, for instance, is a very good example of one, and it's actually quite. It's wonderful when you see something, you imagine this was done 300 years ago, 500 years ago, and it's someone tells you it was done last century, and it's, yeah. You're someone, your, your, your father came to Britain um, from Ethiopia in the 90s. Your, your mother, mother was born here. Do you understand why the National Trust is trying to address things like Britain's colonial past? That It comes from a place where they're trying to explain all of history, doesn't it? Mm. Yes. Well, I mean, the the whole Black Lives Matter movement and things, I mean, the, it was in response to that, that the National Trust did this. I mean, it had been going on, I think, for a couple of years beforehand. I believe, I may be wrong, but the Colonial Countryside Project, I think, had been going on. It did on. start in 2016, I think. Exactly. It was so it, was, it did start a, a bit before that. But the the um the rationale that they say they, I mean they, they say this is happening because they want to make the national trust more inclusive and things to my mind having a, a membership which costs a very significant amount of money um, and is in- inaccessible to lots of people of any back of any sort of racial background. I think that's a. If you are genuinely interested in increasing inclusivity, there are things to focus on before you go to let's you know change the rhetoric on our plaques there are things where you can make a genuine difference where people like from any tar- you know, target communities with 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 um membership deals or what well i 
I don't know. You could gen- you could just decrease the membership fee, or you could you could lower the you could make retain the membership fee as it is, and and make it cheaper to go into sites. For some places now, just to go on a walk in the in the garden of a place, you have to pay sort of eleven pounds or thirteen pounds something. Whereas in the past, it used to be it's free to go into the outside areas, and it it costs to go inside the building. So the thing is, if you genuinely want to increase inclusivity, my point is there would have been there would have been other places you would have gone first. So the thing is. I'm not sure to what extent it genuinely is to increase inclusivity rather than to virtue signal. And I think there's, I, I, I don't know, but I, I don't feel necessarily that say, saying, um, you know, drawing out the, the worst bits of a, of a property's history um, is going to draw more people to it. But ignoring those parts would be as bad, wouldn't it? Ignoring, yeah. um, let's take um, Penring Castle, you know, funded by by money from the slave trade yeah. to ignore that past would be as bad. Absolutely, and I, I've, we've Risk Tor Trust has never said we should ignore that past, and I think it's very good to have every bit of a property's history explored. And it's just a disproportionate focus, which is rather strange, and it's also the use of activists to write it rather than qualified historians, which we take uh, which we take us you with. What's your background? You're called an anti woke activist by the Guardian. Is that a badge of honour? Um, well, I'm not sure. I mean, it's a very easy way for them to characterise. Uh, you know, to sort of tribalise things. I'm, I wouldn't describe myself necessarily as anti-woke. I mean, I think a lot of this stuff that we're arguing for actually is common sense rather than woke or anti-woke. I think those sorts of labels are quite unhelpful. And I thought it funny that that Guardian article also described me as a right-wing commentator, whereas I'm not really a commentator of any sort. But it, it you was... You should work <laughs> for exchange, the right at the centre think tank, and say yeah, what you thought. Yeah, I suppose so. But I mean, it. Uh, um, yeah, I, th- I think labels are used quite unhelpfully. And I and I think the, the, a lot of the stuff that Restore Trust is doing, I wouldn't see why any member of any pa- any party, you know, of any political stripe, why they should, why they would argue against. Have that. you met with with the Director General? Uh, Hillary, Not yet, Hillary no, McGrady, but I did. Or the new chairman? <laughs> no, I haven't, but I did meet one of her advisers, and unfortunately, he didn't seem very um, receptive to the issues that we raised. Whether that was volunteer issues, whether that was Clandon House, whether that was the dem- democracy thing, he had an answer for everything, not a satisfactory one at all, but uh, very much in denial about the things that are going on. That's the feeling we get from them. You also joined the Victoria and Albert Museum as yes. a trustee. Yes. Your first meeting is today, looking very yes. smart for your first <laughs> meeting. Um, what do you want to do there? Are you concerned about any issues there? Um, well, it's not so much concern. I love the v and and I've always liked it, and I like art, and I, I <laughs> you know, I just love art and design. Um, so it was uh, something, it's a museum that I've always loved. Um, but of course, having worked on the History Matters Project at Policy Exchange and things, I do have this interest in making sure that institutions are run in the way that they were intended to be run and that they stick to their founding. Do you think that there's, that there's a cringe about Britain's past? Um, Is that a worry? I mean, you, hmm. when some of your work at Policy Exchange, you talked about when councils try to rename yes. road names because yes. they might allude to some event from the... Yes. From the the colonial part of this country, which yes. is some people might find offensive. Do you think there's a? Do you think that that maybe people need to be bolder and mm. accept that you know something's happened, but some good happened too, and not not to be in, in such a crouch about well, the empire. Well, abs- I absolutely think that we should have a have a balanced and sensible view on things, and not base uh, base decisions on a fashionable, you know, whims or you know, or the stuff that's going on on social media, because often a tweet goes out. Before before you know it, whether that's true or not, it's gained sort of you know thousands and thousands of likes or have because of the rhetoric. And I think we need to be careful not to fall into that trap. If eighty five percent of people on a street said no, we we don't want to live on a street that's named whatever, I think that's fair. But you know when you have a council because of a particular political leaning or whatever deciding that they're going to change a name without having consulted the residents and businesses on that street, I think that's terribly unfair. And it also it incurs a lot of expense for those people. And so, Dito, how, how, how can listeners who are interested in your work get in touch? Well, I think we, I would advise them to look on our website. Um, we've got lots What's of... What's that? It's called Restore Trust. Um, and on there, they'll find information about our members' resolutions, our council candidates. And since voting is opened now for the AGM, I'd advise them to vote for us if they're a National Trust member. National Trust may say otherwise. <laughs> who funds their Restore Trust? Um, the me- National Trust members and volunteers and tenants, I mean, lots of people who are involved somehow in the National Trust and often have been for decades, but are saddened by the way, by the direction in which it's going. Well, so you too, Gabrielle Harness. Thank you for joining us this week thank you on Chopper's Politics. Great to have you on. Thank you so much.
Now, our country may feel like it's falling apart, and normally, when there are problems, they can be vented in Parliament, where ministers are called by Parliament to answer questions about what the hell's going on. But Parliament isn't sitting, and that's because we're in the middle of the party conference season. But what is the point of party conferences, as my wife often asks me every time I disappear every September and October? We sent out our roving reporter, Meghna Nanu, to the bars of Liverpool early this week, where Labour was holding its party conference, to talk to lobbyists and Labour members about why they feel it's so important. Meghna asked them one question. What is the point of party conferences? Here's what they had to say. It's a good question. I've been trying to work that out today myself. My name is Phil. I'm from Manchester. I live in London now. I work in policy, energy policy. I think it's probably mainly around networking, making sure that people who sort of work in their own sort of space and their own silo come and learn more about different areas and meet different people and, yeah, network across not just subjects but also parties as well. It's good to see a variety of different views being represented here today. Anna, and I'm in public affairs. I think it's just an opportunity for everyone in politics and policy to get together you know, really hammer out the debates and also a great opportunity for businesses to, you know, talk to MPs and talk to policymakers, for trade unions to make policy, for, for Labour to just come together and really hammer out what the next manifesto is going to look like. I'm James, I'm 19 and I'm from Cheshire. Uh, well, I think the most important point is, you know, we're bringing Labour members together to discuss policies. And I think, well, in the past few months, we've become a lot more hopeful about you know, getting a Labour government. It seems realistic will be the government, so now we can start talking about the policies we're going to put in place. We're going to invest in green industry. We're going to reverse the cuts in the high rate of corporation tax and invest in nurses instead. So I guess discussing all these kind of policy ideas that could soon become reality is what's important in this conference. So I'm Sean Coley. I'm the Public Affairs Lead for the West Midlands Combined Authority. I suppose it's... Um to get a feel for, for the individual parties' buzz, their mood, what it looks like uh, you know, for, the, for the future party of government. So the Conservative Party Conference, of course, they are the party of government, so it's, it's very short-term. For Labour, there's a good chance that they might be the next party of government in a couple of years' time. So it's to get a feel for a policy. It's all about debate and, and, and how we can influence that debate. I'm Margaret Rees. I'm the Mayor of Bristol. Well, I think it's to get people together, right, to make the connections, to come into you know, alignment, to agree policy and just to, just to rally the party. And it's also to obviously get messages out to the country. You know, but I'm a bit of a sports person, you know. I, to me, this is like getting in the dressing room before, you know, before a game. You've got to go in, you've got to get agreement on what your strategy is going to be. You've got to look each other in the eye and you've got to agree you're all on the same team and that's what this is about. Meg the Nanu there with a taste of what it's like to be at the party conference, this time with Labour up in Liverpool. Now, Magna, we're back in the studio now at Telegraph Towers. How did you find the people you met? I think that the kind of spirit was very, very different this year in terms of it felt like a lot more unified a party. Uh, the mood of the people yep. I spoke to, at least, was that Labour was going to be the next government. And that's why they're there this time, to get to, get to talk to Labour shadow ministers and get to know the party. So there's a degree of reintroduction, isn't there? Well, exactly. And I think that a lot of the members who obviously pay fees to the party and lots of the delegates were all there to vote on policy uh, and see, see these people in person. So the main thing is voting on policy. That's for Labour. And, of course, that won't apply with the Conservative Party. But is there more to it? Is it more about uh, morale and, and getting people in the same room who all have the same political ideas and trying to generate new thoughts to, to punch through to the electorate? Uh, yeah, I think so, definitely. And you can see that in kind of like how packed all the conference halls were for all the speeches, you know, not just Keirs, but for shadow ministers. And, you know, there's so many standing ovations this year, whereas mm. last year, you know, there was lots of heckling and there wasn't that kind of sense of division, I don't think. And when you ask people individually why they were there, did they often have to think about the question or was it obvious? Well, I think it's quite funny. Obviously, we've just listened to it. Um, you can hear some people, you know, said that's a good question. But lots of other people were saying... We're here to kind of just get to know the party and to try and like influence what we think. But they thought it was worthwhile, did they? Definitely, yeah. And it was really well attended as well. So and I think you can hear the difference in talking to people during the day and then talking to people in the evening. And I think the evening aspects are like a big part of the conference as well. You know, people want to have fun with people who they share the same ideology mm. with. Lots of the shadow ministers and stuff are also mm. there 
dancing with the rest of their party. But going back to the original question you asked them, Meghna, did your question prompt any existential angst about what the hell is the point of this? I mean, my I've been going to these party conferences since 1996, and I think that they seem to me at the time really important and vital, but very little actually cuts through even a week afterwards. I mean, at the Labour Party conference last year, the um, claim from Angela Rayner that the the Tory party was scum. That went on for weeks because it was actually an offensive remark, but nothing else really cut through from the conferences. I mean, no one really remembers what's been said. I often liken it to to kind of a crap version of Davos without the snow. But you think people were happy to be there? Yeah, I think people were really happy to be there uh, and kind of see, see the new sort of Labour Party, as it were. But also, yeah, I think the worst thing which happened this year was uh, the backbenchers' comments about Kwasi Kwarteng. Yeah, those remarks by Rupert Huck, of course. Yeah. And what was interesting was they were immediately, immediately squashed, weren't with. they, and dealt with by the party leader. Well, would you, would you go back again? Would you go if you weren't being paid to be there, Meghna Nani? Would you go to the party conferences if the Telegraph weren't paying your salary to go? What, just just to observe it? Yeah. Uh, prob- probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's all for this week, listeners. We'll be back very soon as I'm hosting three live Choppers Politics shows at the Tory party conference. And I think you can agree there's much to talk about. These podcasts will be shown live on the Telegraph website on Sunday, Monday and Tuesday at 1pm. Or if you're attending the conference, why not join us live in the audience and ask a question? We'd love to see you there and put your questions to our guests. On Sunday, Michael Gove and Jake Berry. On Monday, Jacob Rees-Mogg. And on Tuesday, Suella Braveman. So 1pm on those three days. Please do tune in. Thank you to my guest this week, Julian Jessup, Zuditu Gebrahanes, and of course, everyone who spoke to our colleague, Megan Nanu, at the Labour Party conference. Thank you to my producers, Giles Gear and Louisa Wells. But most of all, thank you to you for listening. If you've enjoyed this show, please do leave us a rating and a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It really helps other people find this podcast. For more Westminster Insights, straight into your email inbox every weekday, why not sign up to my daily Choppers Politics newsletter? The link to that is in the show notes to this episode. And be sure to check out my weekly Peterborough Diary column out at 7pm on Fridays online and in Saturday's Daily Telegraph. And remember, if you can, please do buy a copy of the Daily Telegraph. You won't regret it. Until Sunday, cheerio!